Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm William Chen. And I'm Sarah Watt. And each month at Cinema in Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective with some connection. It could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. However, as is now tradition at Cinema in Context, we take the time in December to discuss our highlights of the year. And previously, that's been our best films of the year, but over the last few times, we've we've looked more diversely at what has been offered in 2022. Uh, and this time, we are talking about um, our best film, our biggest surprise of the year, the worst film we saw this year, the most fun we had at the cinema, and the best season of television we saw in 2022. And I guess to say that we will try and keep spoilers to an absolute minimum, especially when we're praising the films and the TV series that we loved. But we've just discussed that worst film, maybe all bets are off. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we might get a little bit uh, excited there. So, so we'll see how we go. You have been warned. Um, but yeah, let's, let's kick into our highlights of 2022. Hey, Sarah. my favourite time of year. <laughs> nice. oh, it's the most wonderful time <laughs> when we get to look back and go, huh, 2022 was a bit of a rubbish year in the cinema, which is a general consensus, and you, some of you may beg to differ, absolutely. Um, so I have the privilege, thank you, gentlemen, of uh, leading with my best film of the year. Now, as is traditional, readers, listeners, watchers, we're allowed to mention a couple of films that were vying for top dog uh, on our road to the, the greatest film. So... Spoilers um, aside here, ladies and germs, and if you did not catch the wonderful French film Athena on Netflix, then uh, I would say for sure that that is one of my runners up for best film awesome. of the year. Athena is set in a housing project uh, in the banlieue of Paris. Um, it is extremely um, vibrant, violent, edgy. It is that classic uh, contemporary, sadly, contemporary story of police versus uh, the underclass, I think it's fair to say. Um, and it isn't directed by, but it is produced by Laj Lai, or Laj Li rather, who was at uh, Cannes back in 2019 when I was there with his film Les Miserables, which is not about hearing the people sing the songs of angry <laughs> men, although there were a lot of angry men in Les Miserables. <laughs> and it's a similar gritty uh, cop drama, and that will for sure have been my, I think that was my second best film Ooh. of 2019 when we did this. Mm, I remember so, that. Mm. Yeah, so Athena, I think, is still on Netflix. Highly recommended. And one of the key selling points about it is there are a number of continuous shots that are absolutely exhilarating because you're dealing with explosions and gunfire and people on motorbikes and the choreography around that is, is sensational. There is less to say about my other runner-up, which is the, uh, the massive film Elvis. Oh, I think, wow. wow. I think, Goodness gracious. I think so. Mm. Um, it was that or awesome. Emma, Emma Thompson's uh, Leo Grand film, but I went five stars on Elvis, and I think if I'm going to be consistent with myself, I might just have to say my experience of Elvis was really wonderful. We've talked about that at length in a previous podcast, sadly, without you, William, I think. Oh, no, you no, were there no, for I Elvis. I hated that movie. <laughs> That's right. You were there <laughs> for Elvis. That's and I was somewhere right. in the middle, wasn't yeah. I? I sort of loved That's it. That's right. The end of it for me. But that was a, that was an exhilarating... Oh, wow. You know, akin to a, a best film moment for me. But, mm. ladies and gents, and I know that I have mentioned this in a previous one of our podcasts, while I was overseas uh, at the beginning of the year and I spent several months in England, um, husband came over and he and I went to the Brixton Academy. No, we didn't. We went to the Ritzy <laughs> Cinema in Brixton, I'm sorry. And we watched the longest, most amazing, most moving, most exhilarating documentary about the great Ennio Morricone, mm. the wonderful film director who died in 2020 at age a million, having created at least seven million um, wonderful film soundtracks. The film is very long and it is curated by Giuseppe Tornatore, the, um, the director of Cinema Paradiso. Wow. Um, and it's very, I mean... You don't want to use the word polemic particularly. Um, or, or, all I guess I mean is it's a documentary and it is unreservedly a love affair of Ennio Morricone. Uh, Ennio is obviously interviewed in it and there are many, many other great and goods of the cinematic world raving about his work. But the beautiful thing is, because it's incredibly long, you get heaps of scenes um, from the myriad films that he composed for 
Uh, and if you're watching that in a cinema, what a wonderful opportunity to just have a greatest hits of the best films from the spaghetti westerns and the mission and everything there is. And it was incredibly moving. I, I wish that I had seen it again. Um, and if I ever manage to buy a big television, then I will buy the Blu-ray and I will spend the rest of my life watching it. So Ennio, about Ennio Morricone, will be for sure my best film of uh, an otherwise slightly patchy year. Oh. Wow. That makes me so excited. I remember you talking about this and at the time thinking, I'd really love to watch that. But to bestow upon it that honour, because mm. I love In Your Morricone. Mm. You know, I think, I, I, what, a three-hour documentary about yeah, his music. Much. I would just love to, to bask in that. Exactly. I'm, I'm thinking my brother, he's a sound engineer. He mm. loves In Your Morricone yep. score. I'm thinking Christmas is coming up. What a perfect sort of afternoon, <laughs> rainy afternoon. I was surprised we didn't get it here. I thought maybe mm. it would come for our New Zealand Film Festival in the mm. middle of the year. I, and I don't think it did. So, do you know um, is it on any platforms? I I haven't seen it uh, on any. I can maybe have a look. Um, maybe it's a rent. Maybe it's a rented off one of those. those don't places. know. Don't know. But anyway, yeah. There oh, you go. Great. And I've said it before, but I have to say it again. Sarah has her own podcast called The Sound of Movies, and one of the episodes is on the scores of Ennio Morricone, mm. and it's it's a blast. It's a really wonderful piece of, of audio listening, mm, so shout you. out again. Thanks, Jeremy. I do need to be getting back to that. I'm halfway through an Atticus Finch, Trent Reznor episode, oh, so wow. I um, need to be getting that one out the door. So thank you for that plug. Oh, that, I'd love to. That's my that. impetus. <laughs> is Watchmen <clears throat> there? Is Watchmen being mentioned? Um, well, I don't know yet, because it's not finished. Oh. Um, but good top tip yes anyway. so yeah there's my best film guys Kilda, wonderful all right my run-ups uh i have a lot of run-ups I, I actually thought this this year was great for movies <laughs> <laughs> um especially animated movies there's, there's some real bangers but first of all run-ups for tv I, i've talked to you guys about the bear mm. on fx yes i like the bear ah awesome you've seen it yes cool 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 just not to the end end i think we've okay. got one ep to go oh yeah. nice uh to, to me I guess the the you know the blurb that sums it up the best is if um, if oh, oh what was that movie the Adam Sandler Jeweler movie um, Hidden Gems Hidden Gems if Hidden Gems was in a Chicago beef restaurant yes right Italian beef then that is the movie it's about the stress of running an eatery yeah uh, it is extremely intense very stressful. Um, but it has that Ted Lasso vibe. It's about the people, you guys. Mm. It's about the people. And it's, it's not about... quite as benevolent as Ted Lasso. No, no, no definitely <laughs> not. De but it's, it, I find it has similar vibes with Lasso in that it's about a mismatched family of a profession coming together to, you know, better ourselves. Nice, oh, nice. Um, really cool. I was traumatized early, in early days of working in a kitchen. So I, <laughs> even you're talking about you it's making find it my very heart. Very yeah, you, I don't think you will oh, like it very no, much. <laughs> What else have you got? Uh, the rehearsal, which Jeremy, you talked eloquently about in our mini-sode. Uh, just mm. such a weird, weird show. Uncomfortable, but I think essential viewing. Uh, Peacemaker, the James Gunn um, and John Cena project from the beginning of the year, where you take this CD, Z-grade superhero slash supervillain, and you make a show around him about losers. Mm. And it's, it's an incredible show. One of the best superhero projects out there. Mm. Um, just so happy it was made. And there's going to be a season two. <laughs> In terms of films, um, Marcel, The Shell with Shoes On. Which Ooh. is a lovely little movie. Ooh. Um, just uh, If you haven't seen it, I, I would highly recommend it. Just this wonderful little movie about like life and ex existence. Mm -hmm. um, focusing on this tiny little shell dude. Who has shoes and one eye and their adventures through like a modern landscape, trying to navigate stuff like social media, you know, uh, taxis. It's it's amazing stuff. Is it an American? Uh, yes, it, it is. Is it Jenny Slate? Is it is it, is it Jenny Slate as myself? Well, because that's what I want to ask. Because oh. Jenny Slate made that with her ex-husband when they were together. Oh, as okay. a project that they just started building themselves, ah, and then when she okay. broke up with him and went off and, and started the, a the whole with... the whole movie is about a breakup. Well, that's fascinating okay. because I've been thinking that they must have got back together, not, not romantically, okay. but back together professionally to oh. make this project. Because oh. she went and dated... Uh, um, Chris Evans. Chris, yeah, yeah, Captain America. Yeah. Yeah, and so that was a horrific mm. journey for her and the way she was treated publicly. But okay. oh, Yeah, it's Jenny Slate. Jenny Slate's, Do you know oh, Slate's voice. That's so cool. Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Bad Guys, the DreamWorks movie. Um, Sarah, uh, if Doug hasn't seen the, the Bad Guys, oh no, wait, yes. get him to see the Bad Guys. You mean the animated one? The animated with, one with Sam Rockwell's yes. voice. Um, oh, that was a wonderful film. I took yeah. the nephew to that. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was neat. And the, Doug has seen. Okay, it. good. I think but, he saw it on a plane. I think. Okay, yeah. not ideal because it's a beautiful movie, but yeah. uh, 
But yeah, you, you I, can't. <laughs> Who are you to speak on that, yeah. William? I'm yeah. so sorry, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's just a movie that takes early Studio Ghibli stuff, as in like Sherlock Hound early mm. or or Lupin the Third early, and then takes that aesthetic and turns it into CGI. I, I've never seen anything like it. What a beautiful movie. And mm. it's witty. Yeah, For those it's, of us who are less very animatedly uh, inclined, it's a witty, fun yeah. film, hey? And the, the voices are, are great. Wonderful, yeah. Um, the House on Netflix, which is a horror anthology, three stop-motion films, which I can best describe as, what if Wes Anderson's Fantastic Mr. Fox was a creepy horror film? Oh. Um, so lots of ruffling fur, um, yeah. just really good stop-motion. Uh, and a... Oh, Barbarian, which uh, is awesome. Uh, also a horror movie with lots of twists and turns built into the narrative. I had so much That's fun. That's the latest Inyaritu. Oh. And it's only just Oh, out. it's not in- Oh, no, it isn't. No. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Bardo. <laughs> it's not Inyaritu, yes. it's <laughs> that Barbarian. Is a very different movie. That's right, I'm sorry, sorry. Yes. It's yes. Barbarian in Inyaritu. No, oh. sorry, my bad. Barbarian. <laughs> is there any new in- Inyaritu? Yes, and it's called Bardo, and mm-hmm. I think it might be coming out today. Sorry, William. <laughs> okay, sorry, cool. nothing to do with what <laughs> we're talking about. Okay. Good, about, my bad. Um, <laughs> and then Barry and I've heard great things about. Uh, it's it's super fun. Just the structure, the, the structure <clears throat> of the movie makes the movie. Um, Song the Hedgehog two, which I brought up again you and are again. So I, I just, funny. I, I've rewatched <laughs> that movie so many times. Specifically, there's a dance fight in it that it's just that tickles my fancy. William is teaching your kids. <laughs> some listeners. <laughs> So that they, 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 it is a movie that uses the hottest tunes from 2015. That's wow. the kind of music it is. Um, and then a couple that we've covered on the show. Um, so Turning Red, which I thought was just I thought awesome, you'd that one, yeah. funny, culturally like relevant. Um, what a great movie from Pixar. And then they released Lightyear, which is oh, it's just such a missed opportunity. Anyway, Top Gun Maverick, which mm. amazing cinematic experience, and mm. I'm so happy to finally see it after two years of not seeing it. Mm. Uh, Decision to Leave, which we covered in our last episode, just again wonderful cinematic journey mm. uh, brought to us by the master that is Park Chan Wook. And uh, my final runner up is Everything Everywhere or At I Once. I thought it would ah, be. Um, it is awesome. It was my top movie for a long, long time. And I'm pretty sure it will be brought up later on in the show, I think. Um, Ah. Just, uh, again, I have loved the Daniels and all their works. Well, I mean, they haven't done a lot, but Swiss Army Man was so good back in the day. And I Mm. think Everything Everywhere All at Once is just, it's a movie of our time that takes all of what works in Swiss Army Man and just explodes it into a million directions. Mm. Awesome. But, dear listener, my best of 2022. Woo! Okay, here we go. Guys, guys, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this November, I watched a French production distributed by Netflix that completely knocked my socks off. And that has firmly cemented itself as my pick for the best of the year. In a city racked by inequity and police brutality, a pair of siblings find themselves travelling down disparate ideological paths after a tragic act of violence splinters their family. Whilst the elder tries to remain rational and collaborates with the police uh, to defuse the situation somewhat, the younger sibling rejects their attempts at reconciliation and evolves into a charismatic, explosive wildcard whose actions could very well bring the city to its knees. This work is a technical masterpiece with some of the most draw-droppingly gorgeous cinematography of the year, further bolstering its spectacular action and resonant themes of socioeconomic oppression and the exacerbating and cyclic nature of cathartic violence. The work also uh, has a one-word title starting with the letter A. But enough about Arcane, everyone. Let's oh. talk about Athena. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. I was going to go. That sounds like Athena. Yeah. Is that your best film of the That's year? That's my best film of the year. Oh my gosh. So good, you guys. Oh my gosh. So you looked at me like you'd never heard yeah, yeah. of it. Oh my <laughs> when, goodness. When you were talking about it, I was like, ooh, this is interesting. That is so funny. I di- Wow, yeah. I did not know you were going to go there. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I'm an easy mark. This was, it had so, so, ladies and gents, last year, my favorite thing of the year was the Netflix or uh, Studio Fortiche animated series Arcane. Um, and so much of it, uh, of Athena and Arcane, they're like mirror images mm, of themselves, mm. um, of each other. And yeah, just give me 
a very Frenchy tale mm. of police brutality and mm. struggle in the suburbs, and I'm gonna eat it up, guys. I'm mm. gonna eat it up. Um, this movie is incredible. The director um, is Roman Gavras, mm. um, and yeah, I think I I had heard a lot of good stuff about it. Mm. Um, I watched it on Netflix, unfortunately. I wish it was on a bigger screen. Yeah, but true. With, with yeah. just. I can only explain it as slack-jawed wonder. May I just say, the good thing <laughs> yeah. about it's being on Netflix is the minute that it ended, we went right back to the beginning and watched the, and first watched the, opening, the opening shot, <laughs> which is, I don't know if it's, it's not 10 minutes exactly. It's, it's around 10 minutes long. Right, it it's, is, a, it's a one-shot. It right. is so, obviously stitched together, but... But the it's intense. not. Yes, that's right. It doesn't yeah. fit. You know what I mean? You can tell maybe, but yes, it isn't meant to be. So yeah, I and at the time I was like, well, I think this is good. This is on Netflix <laughs> because that's the sort of thing you're going to want to revisit, and you can't do that in the cinema. Mm. It is. This is a movie about big, right? Big emotions, big performances. Like there's there's tears, there's screaming, there's the the, the visuals are so big. Yeah, and, and an entire building block gets destroyed for real. Uh, the soundscape is insane. Like yeah. it is fully a Greek tragedy yeah. with a full-on Greek chorus singing about like the the splintering of brotherhood in, in Latin. Oh, sorry, in Greek. Um, uh, it almost watching it seemed to me like it was an inverse of um, of films from ten years ago, like Dread <clears throat> or The Raid, mm. which are all about cops like going into a like uh, a hellscape. The, the hellscape. The, 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 the projects, the block, and trying to extract one person. Mm. Whereas this is talk, talking about the tale from the community's point of view yeah. of what happens when the cops come in and you have to defend your turf. Mm. Um, and of course, it's strongly influenced. I, I was thinking of so many things. 1917, which we've talked about before. Mm. I think this movie is better than 1970 in almost mm. every conceivable mm. manner. Mm, mm, mm. Um, it tells a more coherent story. The action is better. I just liked it better. Like It wasn't as mm. video gamey as 1917. Mm. Uh, reminded me a lot of the Raid Two Barandal. Yes, wonderful film. Um, including the at the beginning, there's a scene where the camera passes through a van and out the other side. Yes. And watching watching that, I was like, I think I know how they did that because they did that in the Raid. And yeah. It's all with cameramen on like scooters and motorcycles yeah. passing, passing it a steering to each cam, other, which is like, oh my god. Because when we rewatched the opening scene, because mm-hmm. um, we were able to talk about it to each other then, yeah. because we weren't going to ruin the film, and I was like, wait, hang on. I don't understand. How are they now outside of the van? And Doug's like, well, that's because they will have passed that. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, keep yeah. going, you know. So it's, it's And the movie yeah. is full of shots like that where you're like scratching your head going, how did they do it? Yes. Because it doesn't look digitally stitched together. No. And Sarah, did you watch the 40-minute making of on, on YouTube? Because it has... No, I don't think so. Oh, it's so good. Oh, yeah. Um, They use just every bit of tech. There's drones. Yes, um, the, definitely The, the drones. first scene where uh, the camera goes by our main character and just keeps flying. Yes. And it turned out that the Steadicam was on this huge drone yes. that the uh, Steadicam operated basically just let go and the drone operator took over. Amazing. Um, there's also a crazy shot of the police basically mounting a Battle of Helm's Deep, climbing up ladders. And, and it's a bit like that scene in World War Z where the zombies are going <laughs> up the wall. Um, do you remember that? Yeah, out, out, yeah. out of Jerusalem and the zombies are all... It's a bit, it reminded me of that. But, but with real extras. Yeah. Okay, no, no more because okay. I want to watch yeah. this movie. Okay. And I yeah. uh, yes, and, and how they film that and how they show them filming it, which is just this huge construction crane with a camera or cameraman tied to the end. was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's it's operatic. It's also really cool, like watching the making of, it's it's really one of those weird community-focused projects yeah. where um, it turns out that a lot of the extras and a lot of the production team were actually recruited from the project. Yeah. Um, because the place was being torn down anyway. They, they picked the place. It's in the Paris, like the Bon Dieu. Um, and they were like, do you guys want to be in our movie? And it made it this this record of a block that was about to be demolished, and these people becoming like movie stars, and it's incredible. And it's really moving as well, which yeah. is unusual for a film that is so overtly, um, when I say overtly violent, I don't mean gratuitously violent. I mean it's just it's a very physical film. Yeah, which is surprising. It's yeah. R sixteen, but there's nothing really truly gruesome about it. Yeah. But it, it's that feeling of yeah. tension. Very and, very yeah. well done. So there you mm. go. Yeah, I'm so glad I'm you brought it up. I'm gonna rewatch it again, Sarah. But I, I watched them. Was like, there's no way any other film can yeah. beat this. And it came out on Netflix. It didn't even have a yeah. cinema release. I'm so excited for both of the films you've just shared. I, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. 
I mean, you had me at Helm's Deep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, my my best films of the year, uh, some of them you've mentioned, Turning Red definitely was a runner-up. Uh, that was a really glorious Pixar offering, mm. and it, we, we talked about it when we did our episode on it, and... Um, we did an episode on it, eh? Yeah, we you did. did. I did it. With, uh, with Phoebe. Yes, and what mm. was it? We, we connected it to... To Brave. Yes, mm. of course. So I, I had a wonderful time in that movie, and I, I'll never, ever forget the feeling of, like, horror when the mother drags the girl into the into the bodega and kind of, like, shame. I was just... There was something within it, and I remember um, my boyfriend at the time just screaming at the screen and, like, mm-hmm. this... And then watching it with my niece and nephews, and they're, you know, one of them's one of them's just gone through puberty, one sort of starting that journey, and just the, the screams of, of shame. Yeah. And it's, it's a wonderful movie. I've still in that not sense. seen either of those. Oh, mm-hmm. so I definitely still need to. Brave as well. Yeah, I've not seen Brave. Brave, yeah, but, but Turning Red <laughs> sure, is, sure. is wonderful. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really good. Um, and you just fall in love with the character within like seconds of the movie, the way they, they crash cut her into the film. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed 13 Lives, the. Um, Ron Howard directed oh, story oh, of yeah. the Thai soccer team because I didn't know I hadn't watched the documentary The Rescue. Yeah, um, that was in my top films of last year. Right. The Rescue was not Thirteen Lives. Well, my my family who watched The Rescue and raved about it. They didn't like the movie because they felt it didn't add anything. I, so that's how I felt. I came to it fresh, yes. and I just sobbed through. You know, it's quite a long movie. Yeah, and I sobbed hard. I thought the performances from uh, Colin Farrell and Viggo Mortensen were fantastic. Yeah. And, you know Joel uh, Edgerton. Edgerton, and I just thought it was a really considered, measured film. And when I watched the uh, documentary, it, it, it was it was aligned to the yeah. to the story. There was didn't seem to be that much fabrication of for drama, and there was actually things that were highlighted in the movie, like the um, the waterworks above the cave. Yeah. that I don't feel got quite the same due no. in, in, the in the documentary. And so I, I really had a good time in that movie. Um, I think you make an interesting point about which that that sounds to me like it's one of those films from which there's the fit the, the the fact and the fiction if you get what I mean or the dramatization and it really just depends which one you come to first rather than one being intrinsically better than the other or objectively better than the other. Absolutely, and so, I yeah. think it's just the, the story, the real story is mm. is is incredible yeah. on its own terms. You and don't so need to. The add first anything. time you get to that story in whichever route is the most affecting. And Ron Howard didn't he just didn't overdo it. No, it was really well put together and I was very impressed Mm -hmm. Um, my mouth was uh, hanging open at the documentary Woodstock 99 oh god that was that was even more incredible than the Fire Island documentary oh not Fire Island (laughs) Fire (laughs) Festival Fire Fire Island is the other film Um, the Fire Festival just the way that that film builds tension and pays it off with what actually happened Mm -hmm. is astounding yeah Uh, the real people flat uh, flat Fat Boy Slim being there, who I love, Fat Boy Slim, yeah. you know, being a talking head, and all these other stars of the time. Yeah, um, it is a, a, a whirlwind, horrifying, of, like hubris. Yeah, um, you know, the little guy being trodden on and not being heard. <laughs> people literally being trodden on, um, and just that time of the late nineties, the pre. 9-11 days where yeah. these stories were the big stories, yeah. and and I do think that the turn of the, the millennium, things have shifted and things aren't quite like that anymore. Um, but it was it was fascinating. Do you know what's super awkward for me is I watched that and I was super judgmental about all the young, mainly young men. Yeah. Uh, at the at that Woodstock '99, and then I realised these people are my age, so those are my people. <laughs> yeah. Even though I never would have gone to such a such a, a rock concert, but I was like, oh, she, yes, that is kind of how there was a, a milieu of young people like that. And what about uh, the a lot of those people saying, you know, would you ever go to a festival like this again? Absolutely. Yeah. It was one of the greatest Best times time. of my yeah, life. Yeah, that's right. And I think about being young and I think about doing some of the stupid things. Like I think about I went to a camp once and we threw hairspray cans onto fire. You know, yeah. so dangerous. Yeah. You know, exploding hairspray cans, molten metal across. But it was so much fun. And yeah. there's that young that young person quality. And mm-hmm. um, But then also the, the real horror of some of the abuses and, and yeah. things that went on. Um, I'm really, really excited about Avatar The Way of Water. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I never thought I would be Frowning this excited. Now. Well, you might. I mean, they will. Water. Oh, yes. <laughs> no. 
um, because I, I, you know, wasn't enamored with that film, the first film when it came out, but I've since watched it when we did our episode yep. with Battle, uh, Alita, Battle Alita. Angel, uh, and loved it. And I had the same relationship with Titanic when that first came out and mm-hmm. I was 12 years old. I was like, eh, watch it again as a, as a young man. Wow, this movie's amazing. I love every other James Cameron offering. Mm. Uh, he's never made a dud film. Mm-hmm. Even his lesser su- successful films are just <clears throat> wonderful. The Abyss and True Lies, which, mm. is, which is pretty successful. Yeah. And um, this film, a lot of people I know have worked on it. It's been 10 years in the making because they've been working on the scripts, or 13 years in the making. Um, it's going to be three hours and 20 minutes long. Oh, yeah, boy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm really excited. I, I'm just, I think it's going to be a ride of a movie. So, but that's, that's not my film of the year because it hasn't come out yet. Uh, William's already mentioned it. My film of the year is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Hey. Uh, it was that film experience that you hope to get, you hope to happen every once in a while. You go in and it just takes you to places you didn't know it was going to take you. I cried. I laughed out loud. I was thrilled by the action. I just love that this movie was the most bombastic, larger than life, outrageous, everything and everywhere. <laughs> All at once in the movie, yeah. um, you know, all on a bagel, um, <laughs> and they made it with a shoestring budget. You know, five guys did all the visual effects yeah. in that film, and just the ingenuity was just we don't see that anymore. Everything's so CGI based, and it was clever. It was Michelle Gondry's type film, but at the end of the day, it's just this very human story about a mother and her relationship with her her life, with her daughter, with her husband, with her dad. Um, and just trying to figure out what the heck it's all about when the world seems to not have delivered mm. what you thought it was yeah. going to. And so it's one of the best films I've seen, not just this year, but in, I, I really do think since 2015 when Mad Max and Inside Out blew oh, my socks off. Wow. So, wow. I, I, yeah, wonderful time at the cinema. Um, I, I can't express how much I love it. One Two of my really good friends, they said to me the other day, we didn't get it, we didn't really like it, we turned it off. And I was like, oh, well, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just too weird for them. They didn't click <clears throat> right. with it. Um, but my gosh, that is a film that's going to stick with me for a long time. So Everything Everywhere All at Once is my film of 2022. That's so cool. good. I, I keep thinking back to that movie, Jeremy, because we saw it together. <laughs> Again, in, in the Rialto cinemas where flies reside. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, Rialto. You're, you're fine. You're fine. Um, but yeah, there, there's so many, so many things about that movie which are just so resonant in this this weird time that we live in, right? There's, I think there's a, a piece of uh, dialogue from um, uh, the husband character uh, where I, he he quotes, uh, this is the story of a girl, and it's like your, your hair doesn't fall down straight, you put on clothes that feel weird, and it's kind of, it, it's this weird metaphor about living through COVID and through a pandemic where people just start, start, start to realise what is it all about? Mm. You know, what am I doing with my life? Can I be different? Is it worth being different? And so many of those those visuals and those scenes and and the, the beautiful de- denouement of the movie is is so so touching. And yeah, we were talking about it like afterwards. I I cried as well. I mm. I cried days after. You know, just thinking about the movie mm. and just this idea. And I don't know how much of a spoiler this is, but um, this idea that you know this character. She's the worst version of her life. <laughs> you know, she is the product of making the wrong choice at every yeah. step of the way. Mm. And that she has access to other versions of her life where mm. she might have done things differently. Mm. Yeah. Is such a wonderful way to explore futility, mm. depression, mm. feeling like a failure. Yeah. Um, you know, and all the things that I guess this, like you said, William, pandemic times have, have exacerbated. Yeah. So, and I, can we just say, Michelle Yeoh. Her performance is like just hands down one of the best things I've seen in the last wee while. And mm. I would hope she's recognised at the Oscars. Yeah. I hope this film is recognised in the way that it deserves. We shall see. Yeah. Maybe it's too weird and out of the box for people. Yeah. But she does things in this movie that is heartbreaking, heart-filling. She does it all while doing her amazing martial arts wizardry. Yeah. Um, and I... Oh, yeah, the cast, all of the cast. Jenny Slate. There, there we go, that's my movie. William, do you want to jump in with your biggest surprise of 2022? Right. 
Oh, uh, Jimmy, you, you forgot to mention Rakakuni, uh, <laughs> which is one of the best setups and payoffs of, of a joke I've seen all year. Yes. What a scene. Yes. <laughs> okay. Alrighty, my biggest surprise of 2022. Um, Sarah, Jeremy, did, uh-huh. you, did you know that sometimes... Some crimes go slipping through the cracks, but these two gum shoes are picking up the slack. There's no case too big, no case too small. When you need help, just call Ch 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 Chippendale, <laughs> rescuing Ch 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 Chippendale when there's danger. Funny man, William. This movie, you guys, <laughs> so, and he is teaching <laughs> some of your children, listeners. <laughs> That's right, I'll be here all night, ladies and gents. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I don't know, did either of you grow up, or maybe it was just beyond your time, Sarah, but the Disney Saturday morning block of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers, Darkwing Duck, uh, Tailspin, DuckTales, a lot of duck-based cartoons. Right. DuckTales um, I watched, but not Chip and Dale. Uh, so these, along with Transformers, were my, my childhood. Yep. Right. I would run home every day to watch Transformers and the Disney stuff. Yep. And they were really good. You know, this is the time when Disney realized that our TV productions have to be different somehow. How can they be different? We'll just give them lots of money. That's right. Uh, and so the production values were always better, better More stories. More than meets the eye. Well, not Transform- Transformers. Transformers oh. was cheap <laughs> All right. I was, just, I was just trying to be like... <laughs> Up with the play, all right. Yeah. Um, anyway, fl- flash forward to 2022 when the Lonely Island, yes, that Lonely I Island, love the Lonely oh. Island, comes along and says, "Oh, we we loved Chippendale when we were kids. Let's make a Chippendale Rescue Rangers movie in the vein, almost as a in the vein of a spiritual successor to Who Framed Roger Rabbit." Um, so I don't know how much you guys know about this movie, but it is not a movie about. Chippendale the characters get this it is a movie about the actors portraying Chippendale in the Rescue Rangers show in the 90s nice mm. so they're chipmunks they're also named Chippendale they're playing versions of themselves <clears throat> um, and the years now the 2020s and they're looking back on their failed career because after the show ended they kind of just wander around Hollywood and nothing real happened <laughs> um, and so as was the case with Roger Rabbit um, mm something happens and it suddenly becomes a film noir based in the world where cartoons are real Mm -hmm. Um, and by cartoons i mean every single type of cartoon Mm -hmm. there's there's the cars from disney pixar's cars Mm -hmm. just driving around the streets of la Uh, there's there's a claymation gumby character who's a police detective there's um there's winnie the pooh there's Soundwave. no no sorry blaster from transformers Mm -hmm. speaking of um, and I know what you're thinking, Mm-mm. William, didn't you hate Space Jam 2 and New Legacy where it was just this IP mishmash? And I think the difference between something like this and Space Jam is that whereas you know, Space Jam 2 and I would say Ready Player One were more like IP grabs to say, oh, look at what we own. Mm-hmm. Aren't we great? Yeah. You know, Warner Brothers, we own Casablanca, we own Rick and Morty. This, and I, I, it's something about it, it truly feels like a labor of love. About, okay, so, so this Transformer is in this movie because we love Transformers yes. as kids, right? Um, it fits with the plot, it fits with the characters. It really, it is a movie about loving, loving things, mm. right? Um, it's nostalgia. Yes, it's heavily nostalgia focused. But it's made by people who seem to actually love the stuff that they're referencing, which is definitely not the case with Space Jam 2, A New Legacy. Mm. Um, it's, it really makes these crazy references. I mean, nowhere else will you find a movie this year that references... Do you guys remember Robert Zemeckis' Beowulf? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a character from Beowulf in this. I actually and, mind that movie. I watched <laughs> oh, it like, it is a weird, on a Sunday afternoon. Weird movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did, yeah, did Ray Winstone? Yes, play? he was Beowulf. Right. Yeah, yeah and there was hmm. a scene where he was naked, and they kept trying to hide as his, his woolly. Mm-hmm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so it has Beowulf in it. There's cats from 2019's Cats. Oh god. Who are also in this. This movie is insane, right? It's it has all the stuff, but it, it's it's so loving about all these references that it never feels cynical, and I think that's the main thing, mm. right? Chip and Dale are voiced by John Mulaney and Andy Samberg, mm-hmm. both, both of whom I love and. I think the overall plot and where it goes, uh, there's a character <laughs> by Wu Arnett, and it's really, really fun and just a really cool TV movie. Now, 
my one gripe with this is it's very, very obvious that the budget is tiny, right? They have all these cartoons on screen, but they just needed the polish of a Roger Rabbit to really make it sing, and they don't. Mm. I, I was reading an um, a interview from Akiva Schaefer, the director, mm. and he was saying their budget was roughly an eighth of a normal Disney or Pixar movie. Oh, wow. Um, but to have this live-action animated mix yep. come together almost to like a sparkling gleam, um, I think is is a work to be proud of, and mm. I loved it, you guys. Mm. I loved it. Nice. Yeah. Is it on any platform? It is on Disney Plus. Okay. Um, okay. Only yeah. on Disney Plus. It was never really sick. Yeah. Right. Put. Right. Ah, oh, nice. Mm. Sarah, what was your biggest surprise of 2022? Well, my biggest surprise of 2022 relates to one of the worst films I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> film reviewing career, however long ago, 10, 11 years ago, when I was forced to watch Pain and Gain, the Michael Bay movie with my beloved Mark Wahlberg and I believe Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That's right. Um, and it was such a terrible, distasteful, appalling film. I gave it, <laughs> I literally gave it half a star. Uh, wrote a very scathing review and have subsequently taught this sounds arrogant but I've taught English you know uh, my English students with that review not because Miss 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 Watt wrote it but because it's an exemplar of how to convey um, negative opinions with the use of language right mm. so pain and gain Michael Bay Fast forward to 2022. Oh my, oh my God. <laughs> oh, oh my God. word. Ambulance. Oh, what? Was, I mean, that, that film was vying for oh. most fun I've had in the cinema, except not quite. But what a surprise. Oh. I loved it. I didn't five stars love it because it's not a five star film. But holy mackerel, that was a good time. Now is I it Ambulance by, is it Michael Bay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Directed by that little known indie director, <laughs> Michael Bay. The one who works with tiny budgets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No name actors. Yeah, yeah. Now, and no normal looking woman. That's <laughs> right. Ordinary, everyday. And restrained editing. That's right. Yeah. So, language films. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So, I love Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, and to me, he can do no wrong. And he doesn't do any wrong in this film. But he plays a bog standard kind of crim brother guy who's trying to entice his brother who's gone good but whose wife has cancer or something, and the brother who's gone good needs the money for the Medicare because America. And so bad <laughs> brother, um, Jake Gyllenhaal, but they're adopted guys because one's black and one's white, but you know, they're white brothers, persuades him to take part in, in one last job. You know how- The and classic, you know, the classic. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. it's all gonna be fine. Yeah, um, and uh, And oh my gosh, the film is so much Fun. There is camera work in that that I had never seen oh done gosh. before. Um, yes, the editing is a little bit fast, uh, a little bit vertiginous, one might say. The performances are fine. I mean, that's not really why you go to a film like this. Um, how do you say her name? Aiza Gonzalez? Oh, right. From um, um, Baby Driver. That's right. Yeah. She's um, the uh, paramedic in the ambulance, uh, in the eponymous ambulance, <laughs> uh, where a lot of the action takes place. But oh my gosh, what a good time. And so the surprise aspect for me is, wow, Michael Bay isn't a complete idiot. Mm. I mean, obviously he's not an idiot box office wise because mm. he produces massive films and people go. But do you know what I mean? Like I've never yeah. really well, he, thought he, of him as a good filmmaker. He, he did make The Rock one of the greatest action movies of all time. Back in the day though. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that was the 90s or mm -hmm. something. And you know. Yeah. So anyway, Ambulance. What a good time, guys. So there you go. That is my biggest surprise, happiest surprise of the year. Highly recommend. Incredible, Sarah. I know. For me as well, eh? Because <laughs> normally I'm so highbrow and so, so oh, disdainful. Yeah. When, when uh, I started to, to realise that you were talking about a Michael Bay movie. <laughs> like, oh well, my it, gosh. It's not my best film of the year, mm -hmm. but it sure is the biggest cool, surprise. So cool. that was fun. I think there's, there's something to be said, right, in this time and time and age you know especially after covid we just we need a bit of fun you as just well. need a good time you need to just be able to get <laughs> lost was, in a film i was i took my godson in england who i never get to see because i don't live near him and uh, and i was like come on now auntie sarah's a film critic sort of thing and uh and he's uh, he's at that teenage age of not a lot of uh not doesn't give you a lot back but he thoroughly enjoyed it mm -hmm. but i think i was quite embarrassing because i could not stop myself from going Oh my gosh! <laughs> and things like that, very audibly while it was happening, you know. And like laughing in my yeah. delighted way. So nice. there you go. Mm. Yeah, good times. 
Well, my biggest surprise of the year is Top Gun Maverick. Oh. Hey. And I, we talked about it in our, in our episode. I just had no interest in seeing this film. When we did the original Top Gun mm. years ago for one of our episodes, I was <clears throat> in, extremely bored and unimpressed. <laughs> Positively resentful oh, that we made you watch it. And I just <laughs> fought, fast forward through all of the flight sequences. Um, Ooh, I didn't. Someone was in the danger zone. Yeah, I yeah. just did not connect with that movie one iota. Uh, and so went into this film begrudgingly. Um, you know, you all know I love Lady Gaga, so I wasn't hugely enamored with her song, but mm-hmm. there was something kind of exciting to know that she had collaborated on the score with Hans Zimmer mm-hmm. um, and others. And so went along again with the same friend I have brought up today, my friend Steph, uh, who came with me to um, a few of the other movies we've, we've talked about in previous episodes. <clears throat> and we both were a little bit like, uh, let's just go watch this, this big movie. Mm-hmm. Audience was packed. We talked about that in our episode. And it was like such a blast. That's what an awesome. Absolutely joyous film. Um, you know, not perfect. I think we've talked about the Jennifer Connelly plotline yeah. kind of being there as a prop for him to voice his, his, his concerns and opinions. Mm-hmm. But my goodness, just classic cinema. Yeah. Put together so wonderfully. Yeah. Just again, no cynicism and yep. uh, that whole sequence where they have to fly up and then down into the hole and then blow the thing up and get out and. It's that it's that Star Wars connection where we know exactly what's supposed yes, to happen, yes. so that things can go wrong, and we know things are going wrong. And it was nicely know. handled, wasn't it? We said yeah. at the time that they they gave us the blueprint for what we were going to be watching, so it was comprehensible and exhilarating to see if it would work yeah. or fail. Yeah, yeah. 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 Audiences along with the ride through the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just uh, like we don't see movies quite like this anymore and i think that's the reason why i am so excited about avatar way of water as well mm. is that there's sort of this classical cinema and whilst i love the the meta-ness of the chippendale film you're talking about william or everything everywhere yeah. all at once sometimes i just want to watch a story that's not so self-aware yeah um so it was great and we both turned each other in and like, that was really good we mm. that was really good begrudgingly you yeah. know because i don't care about planes i don't care about the military mm. um that sort of macho, mass, hyper masculine world is, is not not that interesting, but it was it was fantastic, great, mm, fantastic, awesome. Shall I jump into the next category of the worst film I saw? <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh boy, I can't wait. So uh, I saw this movie at the Silky Otter out in um, Orake. In Orake, yeah, uh, and I saw it with um, with people who were were great fans of the subject matter, but all of us agreed at the end that it was one of the worst films we've ever seen. Silky Otter is a wonderful cinema. Uh, people listening, we had some food that was brought to us in the theatre. We had some drinks. No the flies seat, on them. No <laughs> flies. The seats are, are reclining. They're comfy. Um, just a great cinema experience. Yeah, I saw someone with the Hedgehog too there. Right. Oh. Yeah. Well, what a way to see that that masterpiece of a gem. Huh. Well, my worst movie is Sonic. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> uh, my worst movie of the year is Dog. Oh, I did not <laughs> see that. That looked Stop. awful. Starring Channing Tatum. Oh. Oh, jeez. Uh, and I was sitting there. It was beautifully shot. I believe he directed it as well. Really? Oh, wait. Channing Tatum directed it? I dog? feel like he did. Wow. Can cool. we, can we, can we confirm up. that? I'll look it up while um, I drag my that, jaw that's cool. off the ground. It's, it was beautifully shot. Okay. Uh, there was some, um, you know, it was, it was, there was some, some merits. But I was watching this movie. So it's a story of a, of a man who has come back from war. And is traumatized, um, and he's uh, given the task of taking a dog that they used to use for kind of um, therapeutic. You know, no, oh. like they, the dog was trained to go and grab people oh. and, and rip them out of of you know right. places, and it was a like as part of police or military. Yeah, military dog. Okay, and so um, this dog had seen trauma as well and was dangerous, and mm. was he needed to take it to a facility to put the dog down. So that's what the story is. Of course, it's a metaphor for his brokenness and he's yeah. building this relationship with the dog. Yeah. And, and but he's, he's military, right? So he's probably really efficient, took it in, got it put down, and that was the end of the film. <laughs> no, no. no. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so, did you find out if you directed well, it? Well, yes, so Channing Tatum, Tatum co-directed it with a chap called Reed Carolyn, who is a producer of such films as Magic Mike, Magic oh, Mike 2, okay. Magic Mike 3, Gambit, um, oh, 22 oh, Trump Gambit. Street, uh, White House Down. So basically they've the obviously guy. their mates and their collaborators. Cool. Yeah. And uh, they wrote it uh, together and d- co-directed it. So there you go. So the film um, was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can get on board with this movie. Maybe this is going to be an exploration of the hypocrisy of American war myth- mythology. 
you know, their, their love of soldiers to the expense of how they actually look after those soldiers when they come home. Yeah. Um, the turning point happened when Mark Wahlberg mimics someone who is, um, cannot see, who is sight impaired. Wait, Mark Wahlberg's in it as uh, well? Sorry, sorry, not Mark Wahlberg. What's his name? Channing Tatum. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Channing Tatum. Like, oh. He pretends to be blind and uses that to gain uh, free entry into a hotel mm. with no sense of that awareness. That classic 1980s movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that was the first thing, and I thought, oh, this is not good. Um, and then the movie doesn't ever have any critique of the military. It's mm. just, I'm like, what is this movie? <laughs> oh. Why is it made? It's not even a fun dog movie, because no. the dog is sort of depressed and violent. Oh. oh, so it's not a like happy dog. Well, they kind of reconcile by the end, but I'm like, that dog's dangerous. That dog needs to be put down. Oh, no, <laughs> which is probably not the outcome that they're looking for. Well, yeah, and so, you know, you already know what the end of the movie is going to be when it starts, you know, what he mm. finds at the end, but... Oh my gosh, it was terrible. Ooh, it was so bad on so hilarious. many levels. But yeah, wow. That's me. I'm going to pass it to you, Sarah, for your worst film of 2022. Oh. Well, um, my worst film was going to be really easy to say Jurassic World Dominion. Um, <laughs> and it would have been Jurassic World Dominion, except that for some strange charitable reason, I gave that film uh, two stars. Um, and I thought we don't even need, need to go into why that was the biggest disappointment, the biggest waste of time. Who freaking cares about that <laughs> film? So I'm going to blow your minds with a film that you won't even have heard of. You definitely won't have seen and nobody ever should. It's a British film. It's called It Snows in Benidorm. Oh. Benidorm is a, um, a Spanish resort town that, that um, Brits go to. Traditionally, it snows in Benidorm. I gave it one and a half stars, which is why it's trumped <laughs> the other one to be the worst film ever. Um, <clears throat> now, you Jurassic will... World Dominion's like, yes. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. You should totally go. So, It Snows in Benidorm was a, a, a pretty small British, I guess, art house film, but it's not particularly arty. Timothy Spall is in it. We all know Tim Spall, yeah. right? And Timothy Spall plays. Um, a slightly drab single man who works in insurance, who's let go, and his boss says to him, take a holiday. I don't think his name is Timothy. I don't think I wrote down what his name is. It doesn't matter. <sighs> Peter, take a holiday, Peter. You've earned it. So Peter decides to go to Benidorm to catch up with his long lost brother. And he gets to Benidorm and the brother's not there. And, of course, because some... I'm so bored. Some, <laughs> idiot, some French woman, I shouldn't say that, but it's, it's directed by Isabelle um, Croixet. I don't know how you okay. say that. Croixet or, or something. She's a proper French filmmaker. She has made this film. Don't do it in a French accent, Sarah. She's made this film. So, basically, drab old Peter goes to Benidorm, which is full of sunshine. Oh, the reason it's, it snows in Benidorm is because on an amateur level, when he's not, like, knees deep, in insurance he loves to look at clouds and look at the different permutations of clouds and all that it's so boring <laughs> but then in Benidorm he meets this alluring woman the only strong thing about the film is that the woman is um, played by Sarita Chowdhury so not only is she a woman of colour but she's in her like 50s or early 60s she is sex on legs because of course she is because Peter's really <laughs> drag <laughs> but somehow interesting to hang out with and she he knows all about those clouds and he knows all about those clouds and so she sort of like you know tries to get him out of herself the most outrageous oh, moment and this, <laughs> okay. well no it, this is this is a spoiler because nobody needs see this film <laughs> um, she, she, she works part time in a nightclub in Benidorm, where she does like a strip tease, which is lovely. Except that part of her act involves pulling strings of pearls out of her intimate places. <laughs> And I'm like, I can't believe this film is aimed at the Bridgeway audience, the Rialto audience, my mother, yeah. basically. You know. Um, I can just imagine the audience at Bridgeway going, my word. Oh, now that's a place to wear pearls. I mean, I, I, know, I, mean, I was just like, you have got to, to be kidding me. So, I mean, um, so it was absolutely the worst film I've seen all year. 
Um, and I had the, what is it, ignominious <laughs> duty of having to watch it and then write something about it. Um, but I, I just, oh, it was just awful. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was <laughs> wonderful. I, I thought you were going to talk about Blonde, but no, this, is, this sounds way worse. Oh, actually, that's a good point. I might even. No, do you know, because at least Blonde tried to be a proper piece of cinema. Okay. And I mean, even though it was objectionable in a yeah. lot of ways, that's a good point, though. But this was just <laughs> like there's no redeeming features to this film, <laughs> apart from the fact that Sarita Chowdhury is, is not your classic sort of love interest woman, the good on her. But, but does Peter end up finding himself? Um, slightly. <laughs> slightly. Just, just a little bit, but not in the way that you might think. It, ah. Yeah. Oh, it's so dry. <laughs> <laughs> and then it turns out the brother's been involved in bad things and Ooh. might or might not be dead and somebody wants to do... And it's all just... Oh, it's just awful. <laughs> so there we go. Incredible. So there you go. What was your worst film? Beat that. Beat Man. that, William I, I don't Jen. think I can. I don't think I can. Um, <laughs> uh, it's interesting because in the past, this this category has always been, you know, the most disappointing movie. And we, yeah. we've all had disappointments this year. I, in my list, I, I was going to bring up like 3,000 Years of Longing, which is awesome until the fourth act where yeah. it definitely wasn't awesome. Yeah. Um, and then When the One Wild, the new Henry Salick movie, which I was so looking forward to. And it's, it's not very good. Uh. Um, but this year, I, I have really, really tried to dodge those stinkers, right? <laughs> to, to avoid the bullets. Like, Jurassic World Dominion, not for me. No. See ya. Oh, so you didn't even see it? No, oh, no. well done. Because I heard what Bravo. you guys said and yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. nope. Thank you very much. Um, Pinocchio, the new... <clears throat> speaking of Robert oh, Zemeckis, yeah. 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 that looks god-awful. Mm. It's like, yep, not going to waste my life on that. Apparently no. it is awful. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Sarah. I, I know there was going to be solidarity, but I don't go see Blonde. Um, no, no, but it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Sorry, I don't click the link to go see Blonde. No, no, don't, don't worry. Uh, don't I, worry. I know I promised. You I, could I'm fast sorry. forward through bits but if you okay. wanted, but I don't know that there'd be any point. Yeah. Uh, also, Morbius, <laughs> the living vampire. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. 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 It was on the plane, and I just said, nope, yeah. not going to click on that. That's right. Uh, I did manage to see Thor 4, which is like... <laughs> And yeah. we talked about that. Yeah. But I kind uh, of enjoyed it in spite of all this yeah, yeah. rubbish. It had, it had some qualities. Mm. Mm. Also, DC League of Super Pets. Um, oh, was that awful? Uh, it was just boring. Yeah. It was so, I couldn't believe how unfunny it was. When I was in France, basically Warner Brothers had purchased every single inch of advertising space. And it was, it was this, this picture of either The Rock's character or Kevin Hart's character, and underneath him, one word, il est hon. Well, well, it wasn't il est hon. It was il est hon? Uh, hilarious. Ah. Well, it was anything but il est hon. Ah. Um, but anyway, uh, the one film that I want to bring up that is definitely the top of this list is the only film that made me sit through two entire hours of Mads Mikkelsen planning to use a reanimated dragon deer to rig the elections. What? My goodness, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets oh, of Dumbledore. Oh, yeah. Dude, what the heck was this? I didn't. I, right. I saw this on a plane, and I know, Jeremy, you, you said it was better than part two, and yeah, I agree with part that. Part two was terrible. Uh, Sarah, you you took me to the, the premiere of part two, and I remember both of us we actually both falling asleep. asleep. Yeah. Yes. And the, the, <laughs> this <Yeah>. movie, <laughs> I don't know if I know that. This movie is not that. Like, it's uh, thematically, it, it's not, it's not, you know, like... Sleep inducing, at mm, least. Mm, mm. Um, soporific. Soporific, there we go. But it, it just, it seemed to me like the worst possible direction to take this franchise, right? I was on a plane, I was bored, so I was like, okay, let's check this out. Um, and we, we've brought this up before. Like, Jeremy, I think you were saying that a lot of the Harry Potter stories work, especially the early ones, because they are, in essence, detective stories, right? And J.K. Rowling is a pretty decent mystery novelist. Like, mm -hmm. she sets up the mystery, um, there's red herrings, there's dead ends, but our trio end up, like, uncovering the guy, Scooby-Doo style. And her latest book series, I have to say that she writes under a pseudonym. Okay. Phenomenal. Oh, Phenomenal okay. mystery writing. Nice. nice. Particularly the fourth, fifth, and sixth. The okay. sixth one just came out this year. Fifth book is one of the greatest murder mysteries I've, I've Whoa, engaged with. Good awesome. Lord. She's incredible at that piece Good. Of, of literature. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. 
because uh, this this isn't no <laughs> this isn't in the same yeah 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 um, and it, it's kind of like how the, I found the latter Harry Potter's uh, book six and seven well six was still a mystery of sorts half Hufflepuff Prince but book seven was just such a slog to get through and it's mm. like you've lost the tension of the thing mm. and then for Fantastic Beasts all three movies to be these very very disparate almost political tales of intrigue it just mm. doesn't work and what it felt to me was the the, the move away from what makes Harry Potter work into this, and it really is just a story about Trump, right? It's, it seems to me that J.K. Rowling was watching the, the 2016 elections going like, this will not stand, I have feelings about this, yeah. and writing it into a script that was already halfway through. Right. Um, it's about a guy trying to rig the magic elections. Right. It's like, that's as exciting as the movie gets. Oh. Yeah. Um, and even Mad Mik- Mads Mikkelsen can't say yeah, that. I, I, I'm mad about Mads. Yeah. I, I, I should have a t-shirt saying Mad yeah, about I was going to say, that would be a better t-shirt than <laughs> Vertigo. It's fine. <laughs> There's just such a lack of fun in those movies, yeah. isn't there? Whereas Harry Potter is so much fun. And I think they try... In this movie, they try and bring the fun. There's a scene, a really lame scene at the end where they try to um, uh, Thomas Crown affair with everyone holding briefcases. Oh, and yeah. one of the briefcases is the real one. Yeah. Um, and in the background, they, they play John Williams like... Yeah. But it's like, there's no whimsy here. No. But no, no matter how hard the music tries to carry right. it. Um, and it just felt like such a slog. And the acting is fine. I like Jude Law. I like Mads. Uh, I, I think um, what's his face, um, the Eddie Redmayne. Yeah, he's always like, um, 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 like it's, it's. I don't like his character, but he's, and, he's fine. And what's, I guess. Yeah. what's her name? Waterhead. What's what? Uh, oh, uh, Catherine. Um, Water, is, Water, Waterston. Waterston. Yeah, just not being present for a, the movie. Erased no, from except existence. for the end. Yeah, like just why? We can uh, guess why, but oh, why? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it just was a movie that had no energy at all. Yeah. Um, it reminded me a lot of... You guys know the Asterix albums? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Asta Hicks, um, awesome, awesome comic books. And mm. the last Asterix album by Alberto Uderzo came out in, I think it was around 2006. It was called Asterix in the Falling Sky. And it's like, oh, this is going to be the conclusion of the saga before he passes the reins on. And it's a allegory about George W. Bush. Oh, wow. And it's awful. Mm. And this, to me, felt like the asterisk in the falling sky of the Harry Potter oh, franchise, right. where the creator has such strong feelings about yep. something, but tries to shoehorn it into a property that just doesn't work. Yep. Mm. Um, so that's that's the uh, Dumbledore movie, guys. It was wow. so, so boring. Yeah, you're right. My thing with it is that it did effectively clean up the mess of mm. the second film in terms of the narrative and right. the plot. You know, things made sense. And it did so efficiently, which is yeah, good. Yeah, and it just sort of tidied that up. But it, yeah, without any other reason to be there. Mm, <laughs> mm. Sweet. Sarah, would you like to give us your film that you had the most fun watching at the cinema? Yes, I would, Jeremy. Um, now, guys, you may not have heard of the lead actor uh, of this particular film because he hasn't really done a great deal. Um, but his name is uh, Nicholas with no H. <laughs> Uh, Nicholas Cage, I think he might be. Uh, I know that he's related to Francis Ford Coppola down the line. So anyway, Nick Cage, in the unbearable weight of massive <laughs> talent, has to be um, the most fun in the cinema. Um, I saw it in London in the Prince Charles Repertory Theatre. Theatre, um, again, it was during that three-month block earlier this year when I was over there. Um, and wonderful audience to see it with. Because one of the wonderful things about this... Have you guys... Did you guys see it? No, yeah, I, I, I didn't. Are oh, you saw William. Yeah, you yeah. should totally. And I'm not going to spoil you anything. Um, but the wonderful thing about the film is that Nick Cage is playing a, a, a variation on his theme. Um, so a version of himself. And there are also so many wonderful... Uh, they're not even Easter eggs. They're certainly not hidden. <laughs> but there are so many wonderful references to work that he's done. That you do want to be... Um, relatively knowledgeable um, and, and with a, a knowledgeable audience, you know, and I didn't catch catch everything. There is, there is no way, but it was so enjoyable and it is so enjoyable watching somebody who is actually sort of a caricature anyway, isn't he? I mean, Nick Cage is not really a subtle guy. Um, so Nick Cage playing Nick Cage is actually really wonderful and the fact that the actors on screen with him are able to take the mickey out of him a little bit as well Mm. is kind of a really lovely oh it's really nice he can have a laugh at his own expense and all that sort of thing so he plays nick cage 
being somebody who can't really get any work and therefore um, takes a gig to be paid a million dollars to go to some rich guy's um, birthday party in a fancy, uh, it's off the coast of Spain, I think, isn't it? In a big mansion off the coast of Spain. And he gets embroiled in a CIA subplot that's real. And they're all like, well, you're Nick Cage. We need you to infiltrate. And he's like, I'm just an actor. And they're like, we've seen your work. You can totally do this. We need <laughs> it's like you. Yeah, right, yeah. We need you to do this thing. And so he does. And it's hugely fun. And there are even... Like I will have said over the uh, 81 or so podcasts that we've done, I don't have a lot of time for scenes. You know I don't like scatological humour, which is all about like bodily fluids and waste and whatnot. And I'm not mad on scenes where people take drugs and things get stupid mm -hmm. because I find them boring to watch and often cliche. But there is a fabulous scene in the middle of this <laughs> where accidentally or otherwise they're they're a little under the influence and it's brilliant with, uh, with pedro pascal with pedro pascal who is absolutely a revelation for me because i'd never watched it's narcos mainly isn't it that he's oh, and game of thrones, game of thrones well. and i never watched yeah. got so um so i'm more of a gnt than a <laughs> got girl uh, now there's a t-shirt um <laughs> So, yeah, Unbearable Weight of Massive... Well, I'm amazed that I even got that title correct, actually. But yes, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. What a delightful oh. film. And coming out the year after Pig, which was last yeah. year... Um, which which just, he, he becomes an acting powerhouse Absolutely. In so Pig yeah. was so wonderful at reminding us of all the brilliance of Nick Cage, that mm -hmm. he isn't just the rock, and he isn't just... And he um, isn't just the screaming guy. No, right? that's right. He's actually an actor. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, super fun, and you should totally watch yeah, it. Yeah, totally back you on that, Sarah. Um, my, my main criticism of the movie is Pedro Pascal's character... <laughs> I feel like at the end it's a little bit of a cop out, like in terms of the emotions of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, but th the two of them have such great chemistry. Like the bromance is yeah, amazing. Yeah, the bromance is adorable. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it totally works. Yeah, um, so. heaps of fun, and he goes around wielding his dual pistols from face off, and like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I can't wait. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. What is the deal with these film titles this year, though? With, like, that... Too many words. Yeah, everything, like, everywhere, yeah. all at once. Yeah. Um, you know, the Midnight of Madness of Dr. Strange's yeah. multitude of, you know... Yeah, don't, don't, just... look, no, don't worry, darling. Don't worry, darling. Well, that's just yeah. hard to remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, even even Decision to Leave. Like, what are, yeah. these, what are these titles? I know. What are these titles? Just call it Ambulance and we know where we yeah. are. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, yeah. William, what was your biggest uh, kind of best time at the cinema this oh year? Oh my gosh. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I saw this at the cinema. I really, really <clears throat> do. Wait, did you see it on an airplane? No. Oh, no. Oh gosh. That would be actually an even worse way of watching it. No, this is a Netflix joint. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, w it was released on Netflix. You guys, there's no movie that made me chortle, like jump up in my seat and cheer on the slaughtering of the Brits than R R R. I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, have you Have you guys seen it? That was in the cinema. You could have. I, I know, but I, I don't know it existed when it was on the big screen. Is and, it a Bollywood film? And, no, it's Tollywood. It's Telugu. Um, oh, um, so Filipino. It's, it's, no, 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 South Indian oh, instead sorry, of yes. um, North Indian. Mm -hmm. um, this movie is. It is the best time at the movies mm. this year. I, I see people with like uh, Twitter reactions of people dancing Not in the long, aisles. You won't. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like people having just the grandest time. Edgar Wright posted something when um, uh, RRR was shown at the BFI. Mm. Uh, people applauded at the intermission card. Yeah. It's like this is the kind of movie we're talking about. Oh, that sounds super fun. Um, it's so so. What is RRR? So it's a South Indian movie. I think it's India's most ex expensive movie mm. of all time um and our it's directed by ss uh, ss rajamuli and the title basically is the 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 names of the director and the two lead actors so it's rajamuli rama rao jr and ram charan um the other the two actors are basically from what i read uh like superstars so this is like from a western lens if Tom Cruise and yeah. Brad Pitt I was thinking, were yeah. together as Batman v Superman and Batman v Superman. Like, there's no <laughs> bigger, like, the crest of this wave. Mm -hmm. um, and the movie is a fictionalized retelling of these two real life Indian revolutionaries in the 1920s. Um, so, Aluri, uh, Aluri uh, Sitarama Raju, and Komaram Bhim. 
Um, and about this period in their lives when they were fighting off the Raj, the British, you know, colonization or colonials at the time, uh, but they had never met each other. And throughout their lives, they never met each other. And so the movie poses the question, what if, what if they did? Mm. Ah, <laughs> wow. It is, it is pure historical fan fiction, right? Mm. Uh, these are not the revolutionaries you are thinking of. These are basically superhumans. Uh, like laying the smack down on waves of colonialists. Mm. Um, it is, this movie is so many things. It is three hours long. It does have an intermission in between mm-hmm. where apparently people applauded. But it is historical fan fiction. It's a superhero team up movie. It's a musical. Like there's multiple musical numbers. I wondered numbers. if there were, yeah. Uh, and the musical numbers are extraordinary. Like there's a dance off in the middle, Natu Natu, where, again, this is why people are dancing in the aisles. Um, uh, and it's set up because um, it, it's brief spoilers for Ara, but the um, one one of the the, the bros uh, they have a British love interest who's at the the you know the estate, and she invites him to go to a, a upper class party, and it's a slobs versus snobs thing, and um, one of the dudes there is super racist and classes is like, you you brown people can't even dance the foxtrot, <laughs> and then his his bro who's like I, I gotta help my man out uh, starts banging on this massive beat on these drums and then everyone the indians the brits everyone gets up and just the stage is a dance fight mm. and it's a dance fight that goes on for 10 minutes until everyone collapses from exhaustion so this is the kind of movie that we are sounds talking amazing about. um it's a bromance there's a romantic comedy squeezed in there yeah um it is 110 percent just nationalist <laughs> propaganda though like oh, yeah. it's <laughs> all about how india is great <laughs> India was great back in the 20s, and yeah. it's going to be even greater now. But you know what, guys? Some of my favorite movies are Independence Day, and um, I've talked about Wolf Warrior 2, that Chinese movie about how China's going to save the continent of Africa. And it's I, I, I love this stuff. Just give it to me. I don't really care that it's propaganda. You'll do your own it's discernment. So... You just want to... Well, soak it up. Yeah, kinda. just soak it up. Yeah, um, yeah. I enjoyed the Rambo movies back in the day. You know, mm-hmm. our brave Mujahideen fighters. Uh, mm-hmm. We we pay our respects to them. Um, and it is most of all just and why I think it works and it's not just a silly mess. It wears its heart on its sleeve. Like mm-hmm. it is so earnest. Mm-hmm. The love between the two guys, Mm-mm. like, there's not a shred of cynicism, right? They are bros. They help each other. There's an amazing scene where the, the, the two of them, and this is super brief spoilers, but during their bromantic montage, they're just riding a motorbike and a horse by the beach. <laughs> but, like, there's no plot connections. Mm-mm. They're just looking at each other, being super macho and loving each other, That's riding a motorbike and a horse on the beach. And, yeah. and the movie makes it work. Um, yeah, the, it, it's paced really well, it's long, but you never feel bored, and it's also an, a rare action movie where it's, I think it saves the best for last. Mm. Like, the action beats are so cool, there's a, Ooh, there's a scene... No spoilers? Uh, well, I will watch this. Okay, the, I'll just say, if you've ever wanted a movie where a guy throws a Jaguar at <laughs> another guy and takes out the dude, then this is the movie for you. Awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, RRR, I, I do wish I had... If I had gone to see it when it was showing at the movies, I would have yeah. had such a good time. But watching it at home, still a super, super good time. Good advertising. Nice, nice. Well, my my greatest time at the cinema was actually a really horrible cinema experience. I've just got this vibe where I'm <laughs> talking about the cinemas around Auckland. So um, I was given a Lux voucher for the Hoyt's Lux experience. Oh. So I went to the Hoyt Cinema at Sylvia Park, and uh, it was not a good experience. The 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 poor staff member must have been training, uh, you know, asked me if I want to milk in my long black um, and then took a long time to figure out how to put it through the computer, kind of took our drinks orders and then it turned out we got free drinks with our Lux experience. The seats were really uncomfortable. It just was not a good... I was like, mm. this, this was... I think it cost $80 for two of us. Wow. But I had an $80 voucher. I was like, I will never ever spend $80 on this experience again. It was just not good. But the film that I watched <laughs> was joyous from start to finish. 
and that is Scream. Oh, oh AKA yeah. you paid eighty dollars for Scream. Yeah, I know. Oh well, no, it was a gift, right? So, okay, yeah. Someone paid eighty dollars for Scream. <laughs> yeah. The fifth Scream film was everything I was wanting and more. Mm. Uh, it, it, I, I love those Scream movies, and we talked about it in our episode, which I mm. believe you were not with us. Mm-hmm. They, they, William, yeah. but Doug was with us, and we yeah. had that, that chat. Uh, they always take a different sliver or, or, or of the horror pie and uh, this one was this idea of a requel which is you know mimicking the structure of the original film while still being a sequel to to that series uh, it was great to see the legacy cast come back uh, i really appreciated the new castmates that came in and there was just some wonderful meta moments that were a whole lot of fun I know we had some criticisms to discuss when we had that episode, but I'm completely biased to this film. I had a great time. And I just think the Scream series, bar the third movie, which has really good reasons why it's such a mess, mm. I've loved every single other one of those movies. Mm. One, two, four, and now five. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with the sixth film. Mm. Some of the original cast won't be back because of um, contract you know, conflicts, not being paid enough money, not being paid what they're worth, which is a shame. Mm. But I also do think that that film did a good job of sort of passing the baton to this new cast of characters. Nice. So wow. I had a great time. I haven't watched it again since, so I might go back and watch it and go, oh, why did I say that? But in the moment, Scream was it. <clears throat> All right, let's start with you, William, for the best series of TV that you saw this year. All right. Um, well, yeah, there's, there's been pretty decent TV this year. Um... But, and I, I've harped on about it for ages, um, there's only, I, what TV, you guys? I don't, I'm not usually the person to watch an episode and then listen to the podcasts and then read the breakdowns and the recaps. And I used to be like that for Game of Thrones, but I realized that it just wasn't kind of fueling my enjoyment. I, like, I used to watch episodes of Breaking Bad and download the podcast now. But, yeah, I... I don't really want other people to tell me what I think. I just enjoy it for what it was. Mm. But this is a show that has gotten me back into that mode. Because I love Andor, you guys. I oh, love the show cool. so much. Mm. So Andor is the new Star Wars show from showrunner Tony Gil- Gilroy. You may know him from such works as Michael Clayton. Uh, or the most of the Bourne movies. Um, including the uh, the weird Jimmy Arena one. Mm. <laughs> um, I liked that one. It was the one after that that was terrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think Tony Goroy and um, and what's-his-face? Um, uh, Paul Greengrass. Paul Greengrass. They, they, they need to be together. They can't be split apart. Otherwise, yeah. you get bad Bourne movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I, I, I'm going to make a statement that might be a little galling. I think, and as of the time of recording, there's still one episode left next Wednesday. But I think this might be the best Star Wars content ever made. Wow. Like, including the original trilogy stuff. Um, the original trilogy is heck a lot more fun than this. But this is a show that really feels like one of those old Star Wars expanded universe novels. And just trying to dig into what makes this world tick. Right? It's a Star Wars that's set between kind of the rise of the Empire and the fall of the Empire. And really, Tony Gilroy, as is the case with a lot of the stuff... What he's interested in is not just the heroes and villains, but the the constructs, the bureaucracies, right? The systems in play yeah. that give you the empire the or the rebellion. So what yeah. George Lucas was trying to do with the prequel series. Exactly. Oh my God. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh, just with way better writing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is a show, I mean, you know, someone put it best. It is the quote about the ban- banality of evil, right? Mm. The mm. Empire is not manned by Darth Vader's and, you know, Peter Cushing's, the, the super evil Nazis of the world or space Nazis. Mm. It's just manned by... Your regular Joe blogs, yeah, and, following and orders. They're yeah, following orders. Yeah, it's just following orders, like yeah. social climbers or people who just want a job or or people who are you know have kind of that fascist edge but aren't bad guys or girls. Like, mm. and the rebellion is super messy. It's not all good people, right? Mm. There's a lot of tussle between the rebellion, where the money comes from, how violent do we want to be. There's many many scenes of rebels doing terrible stuff, like holding guns up to the heads of children, like, to threaten, you know, as hostages. It's very, very much playing in, in those shades of grey, and it anchors all of that on the character of Cassian Andor, played by Diego Luna, who was in Rogue One, mm, uh, which mm. is, you know, he was great in Rogue One. He's really good in this, and kind of his travails, and it, it is a prequel, but it, it's not really about him. He's kind of our entry into this world, and it's about the story that's happening around him, mm. right? 
Um, the the pedigree of the show is incredible. Um, already Tony Gilroy, but also Dan Gilroy, uh, Nightcrawler, which again, Love there's it. heaps of Nightcrawler in this as well. Um, Bo Willimon is the staff writer on this show. It's like what the he- he's the the showrunner for House of Cards, the US version. Like, yep. So the writing and the monologues are incredible. Um, uh, uh, what's that? Nicholas Bratel, um, the composer of uh, Succession, what's Succession, and, and Moonlight, and she said, as it happens, oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, so good. Luke Hull, the production designer of Chernobyl. Mm. Um, one thing that I think really makes this stand out amongst the other Star Wars shows, of which the quality has been really varying, is that it it really minimizes the use of their new stagecraft, you know, the volume technology. And we've talked about how that could look really good, like in The Mandalorian, or really bad, like in Thor 4, right? It, when it doesn't look good, it, it is literally people standing in front of the screen. And yeah. look, it, it's awful. And what Andor does so well is the majority of locations are physical, right? Coruscant, Coruscant it's just London. You know, like, London is super sleek, but also brutalist. Yeah. And they just have all these amazing scenes shot in, like, the London suburbs or, or Canary Wharf. And it's like, this feels relatable because it's real concrete and steel. Mm. Um, there's an entire arc of the show that takes place in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, like, and it's beautiful. And it's because there's real people being real, very cold in the Scottish Highlands. Yeah. And it makes all the difference. Um, some of the other things I just want to bring up, um, the cast is incredible. Diego Luna, Stalin Skarsgård plays such a badass. Like he's, he has these monologues, which, oh my goodness. I, I hope he gets Emmy for this. Wait, Stalin Skarsgård, was he in, uh, any of the Star Wars he movies? He was so, so the great thing about this is the majority of this stuff is all brand new. But Diego Luna, who was, is yes. playing the same character that uh, he was in yes, Rogue One. five years before Rogue One. Got so it. it's kind of a prequel. Okay, right? nice. Uh, Fiona Shaw is yes. in this, and she's awesome as, De- as Diego Luna's mum. Also, monologues. The show is all about the monologues, very Game of Thrones-ish. Um, slight spoilers, but Andy Serkis shows up later on in the show, and he just, I think, gives one of the best performances of his career, like mm. Gollum included. Mm, it's mm. it's so good. And he, he's not playing a CG glee clop. He's mm. Andy Serkis, Andy mm, Serkis. Mm, mm. Um, and the final thing I'll say about this, and why I've been taking so many deep dives, is this is a show that's about stuff right it's not about empty fan service mm. you watch obi-wan which is oh, a terrible yeah, show i, was like, I hated episode. it and it's all like oh recognize this yeah. hey here's baby princess leia have you ever wondered about her adventures <laughs> um, no <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> i haven't <laughs> um this is not interested in that it, it's about real world stuff and it's it's very easy to draw trump comparisons but i think it goes a lot deeper than just that right there's a lot of like proper agendas. Like it, it had, the rebels talk about Marxist leanings, mm, and mm. I mean it's not it's space Marx, but y- y- you get the idea. Mm. And the the revolution has shades of both the Russian and the French and the American revolutions, mm, right? Mm. Um, the, we talked about the Highlands. That whole arc is based upon the Highland clearances, where you know the people of the Highlands were chased away from their farmland, so the landowners like it's. It's incredible stuff and historically resonant, um, or to feed into this tale of a like overbearing imperialist regime and how that could kind of ferment, if that's a good word, yeah. rebellion yeah. Um, in a very, very human ground level way. There's no lightsabers yet. There's very, very few lasers yet. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. One, one episode to go. Fingers crossed. Uh, but it is such just a human tale and a wonderful world that the showrunner is taking us through. I love Andor, you guys. Is this Ooh. on Disney Plus? It is on Disney Plus. Right. I, I think it's it's the best thing Disney Plus has ever done. Right. I love this because I've had a few people really rave to me about the show because I gave up. I, I kind of gave up at the last Star Wars film, really. Right. It was so poorly pitched. Yeah. Uh, and then I've just tried some of those TV series and I'm like, oh, this is just more of that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, ex- I'm excited about that. Awesome. Right, well, I'll jump in with mine. Yeah. So um, there, was a, there was a lot of great television this year. Russian Doll Season 2 was phenomenal. Uh, really fascinating exploration of that character in that world and how they took the, the plot device of reliving the same moment over and over again and they, they changed it to time travel in this, in this new series. Um, I've, I really enjoyed House of Dragon. Mm. I didn't expect well, well. that to be such a highlight of the year. Um, not perfect, but not trying to be Game of Thrones and, and carving its own path. And... 
I would say it, it ended with, with a, a cultural phenomenon moment or a few moments that really resonated. So I think it's got some legs and it'll be interesting to see if they get to their, their full order of four or five seasons, whatever they're hoping to, to do. Mm. Um, I thought Sex Education Season 3 was really strong. Mm. Again, not a perfect se- season of television, but a really wonderful building on that world. And um, it's going to be interesting to see where they go in Season 4 now that the, the young people have kind of left high school, right? They've done the three years of high school and, mm. and where will they go mm, and mm. how will the story move forward mm. I know some of the regular characters are not going to be showing back up again because they're like well their stories are done now mm. so um, but it was really good a really strong piece of television I'm only a couple of episodes in at the time of recording but The White Lotus I'm really enjoying and I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the expanding world mm-hmm. of that series and I thought Hacks 2 was fantastic <laughs> Oh, okay. um, I thought the first season was still trying to find its feet but the second season there was this confidence and one of the things about the first season of Hacks a TV show about stand-up comedians, mm. it wasn't always that funny. Mm. Whereas yeah, that's her Gene Smart, right? Gene yeah. Smart, and the jokes in season two were much better. Mm. And I was laughing a lot more. So it's that classic thing, like, we talked about it with um, A Star Is Born, yeah. you know, the song Shallow that mm. that explodes uh, the, the Ali character into stardom, well, yeah. was a massive hit, yeah. so it sells. But when a film tries to tell you that this is a big hit, mm. oh, it's the same with Hacks last season. Oh, it's not that funny. I, you know, I'm not right. buying that you're one of the greatest Joan Rivers style Phyllis Diller comedians in the world. But they do that in season two. Nice. But the best TV I watched this year was an even bigger cultural phenomenon than Game of Thrones. And that is Stranger Things season four, which threw aside the typical 50 minutes to an hour long episodes. They had. It, one of the final episode was two and a half hours long. It was a movie Ooh, length episode. Uh, it was escalating in its references to eighties pop culture, and it was terrifying. So the first few seasons had that kind of Goonies quality, that prepubescent or, or you know just before they're becoming teenagers quality, with a slight eeriness and creepiness. Well, this was fully in the Nightmare Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, kind of zone. If season three was the thing, this was like full on dreams and body horror. Oh. Um, it was the the series that catapulted Kate Bush's running up that hill to number one. You know, thirty something years later, mm. and made was making her millions of dollars. Mm. Um, it is incredibly emotionally intelligent in the way that it works with its characters. Um, it ended its final act in a way that I, I did not expect that really sets up season five to to showcase what the show does best uh, and it was just oh it was brilliant it was so great and the way they released it i think they did six episodes and then two episodes or eight episodes and then two episodes um because they needed to finish off the last few episodes was a really fun way to build momentum. We had a month between oh. the first drop and the final two episodes, which were effectively like four episodes with the length of them. Mm. Um, yeah, just just a great piece of TV and cinema, and I can't wait for season five. Hmm. I didn't. Um, we didn't persevere with Stranger Things, and I know that we're meant to. And I think we did seasons one and two, and then went meh. I know season four, great. The thing that troubles me so much, I have this gorgeous little five and a half year old nephew. And he said to me last night, Auntie Sarah, do you watch Stranger Things? And I said, no, and neither will you for as long as I am in your life, small child. (laughs) Because he knows that his 11 year old cousin has watched it and dressed up as um, 11 for Halloween. Mm. And I'm like, no. My child, my pristine-minded child, it's too soon for you to have these <laughs> these images, you know, s- scarring your eyeballs that you'll never be able to get away from. So, anyway. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I think what's going to be interesting about this TV round is that we're, we, we do all watch... I know there are some crossovers, but we're so far we're referencing lots of different things. Um, so, <clears throat> in terms of the best television of the year... Um, we were very fortunate, no, unfortunate, I suppose, to see the final season of Ozark. Um, and I think the penultimate season of Succession, which we've been thoroughly Mm. enjoying, uh, and I know that there's another season of Succession and I can't remember if it's going to be four or five, but Mm. it's one of those classic wire type situations where David Simon of the wire, you know, mapped out those five seasons prior to even shooting the certainly prior to shooting the second season anyway 
So I know that succession will come to its end, and luckily we have more of that to come. Um, and we finished Better Call Saul, oh, yeah. and that was um, sad to, to farewell, I have to say. It immediately made me want to go back and not only go back to the beginning of Better Call Saul and watch the whole thing, but then hook into the back of Breaking <laughs> Bad and watch all of that again. But coming back to Ozark, I would have to say that, to me, is flawless television. Um, and I'm trying to remember, who here has or, or hasn't watched Ozark? I haven't watched it, neither. So I won't do any spoilers whatsoever. And I think that you know, but too bad, because this is my time on the microphone. <laughs> the thing that I love, I mean, the, look, I'm not into fantasy very much. And I'd never watched Game of Thrones because someone said there were going to be dragons. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> and polar bears or something. I don't that's know. That's lost. Yeah, right. Well, there you go. And I'm like, nope, that's not realistic. But to me, <laughs> realism. Polar bears are realistic. <laughs> not, not, in, not on a desert island. Yeah, I don't yeah, even yeah, know. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> but to me, there is nothing more realistic and Jason Bateman as your family dad, bit of an accountant, bit of <laughs> bit of a good one with money, and his lovely wife played by Laura Linney, and their two children, a daughter and a son. And uh, in episode one of Ozark, you discover that this wonderful nuclear family is, um, in some cases unwittingly, uh, but certainly wittingly in terms of the parents, embroiled in being money launderers for a drug cartel. Mm. What a fabulous premise. I know it's not particularly groundbreaking because we watched Walter White turn from chemistry teacher to drug, um, uh, I was going to say entrepreneur, uh, in <laughs> Breaking Bad, Kingpin, mogul. <laughs> mogul, all of those things in Breaking Bad. But there is something so gorgeously delightful about Jason Bateman, period. Um, and I love the way that Ozark is written. These, these characters come into uh, the family's realm, their sphere. Um, and even though most of them are technically unlikable characters, they are so expertly written um, that there is an exhilaration of seeing them. I, I, it's not a spoiler to say a lot of people die. So, you know, you can pretty much start <laughs> a season and, you know, place bets on how long you think anybody's going to be around for. Mm. But it's absolutely wonderful. And the writing is superb. Now, the writing narratively, I think, is great. Plot-wise, terrific. Um, but moreover, the, the, the in-scene writing, if you will. And for me, there is nothing that nerdy me loves more than a nerdy person talking their way out of trouble. And Jason Bateman's nerdy character, who is so clever... Um, talks his way out of trouble when, you know, these these uh, cartel um, kingpins are, are, are saying to him, you have one more chance, otherwise you, you and your whole family will be dead. You know, he manages mm. to get himself out of tricky situations, and I absolutely love it. But moreover, it takes an ordinary family who are completely relatable in a way and show you, shows you the depths that people can sink to without needing to be sociopathic in order to sink, if you know what mm. I mean. Um, so, yeah, brilliantly written. Just brilliant. The br brilliant dynamic. Of, oh, my God. Just absolutely wonderful. A terrific um, ending. And it would be, well, actually, to be fair, I have watched seasons one and two twice uh, anyway. Uh, and I'll probably watch season three again. But I would say Ozark all the way. Nice. And is that, th that is the third and final season? Yeah, it is, sadly. That's a tidy, that's a tidy season, though. It is three, tidy. Eight, three seasons? I'm sure it was three. I'm sure. I'm sure it was three. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which is, you kind of have that sadness. Yeah. Saying goodbye to the people because you're like, oh, I wish that could have gone on for much longer. It's you good, know. though. You, I think it always, it's always a good thing when those, those well, shows Well, you don't want finish. it to outstay its welcome. You don't yeah. want it to be a Game of Thrones. Yeah. Did it outstay its welcome? Well, I don't know. I think it actually rushed its ending. Yeah. I think it's more if they'd actually padded it out a bit. It would have been much better. Right. Mm -hmm. The first six seasons are fantastic. Right. Well, does anyone want to make a case for what our collective film of the year is? Nothing's coming through strongly. Well, I mean, in a way, our one and two is Athena, but then your yeah. one and two is... Um, top, everything Everywhere. Or Top Gun Maverick as well. Was, it everything could be on the Everywhere table. there at once. Yeah. Uh... Or do we just let it be? We don't need to have a film, collective film of the year. No, we don't really. 
Well, this three there, this this yeah. three that we we put on the table, isn't That's there? That's right. It can be a tie, <laughs> <laughs> three way tie. But I do like the fact that we do not we do not talk about our best of lists before we come together. So I do mm. think that's pretty neat that we do that we do have a um, a first and second place and a first and second place for those films. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please share it with your film loving friends. You can listen to Cinema in Context through SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and other great places where podcasts are shared. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which are great places to let us know what you think of this episode, or give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, and until then, no more mai!